So that was the formula for the work that I erased. Now I want you to think about this in a more complicated situation. This is the usual situation or a usual situation where you're trying to figure out the work done by this spring on this mass. And uh, let's just remember a couple of things. If the spring itself is massless, that is, you take M spring here, um, and if, if it isn't massless, you'd have a formula like M spring times A is equal to uh, the force of the wall on the spring. plus the force of the mass on the spring. But since uh, we typically imagine that the springs themselves are massless, just like we imagine that the ropes and pulleys, uh, when we do systems with ropes and pulleys, are massless, since the mass of the spring itself is generally taken to be uh, massless, compare, at least compared to the other masses in the problem, then we're going to replace the left-hand side here, the whole left-hand side, by zero. And we just learned that then that the force of the wall on this end of the spring is exactly the same thing as the force of the mass on the spring, except pointed in the opposite direction. Now we have two more equations. The force of the spring on the wall is equal to minus the force of the wall on the spring. That's Newton's third law applied to this interaction right here. And we have one more equation. We have the force of the spring on the mass is equal to minus the force of the mass on the spring. That's Newton's third law applied to this right here. And this one told us that the force of the wall on the spring is equal to the minus the force of the mass on the spring. So you combine all three of those equations together and you get that the force of the spring on the mass is equal to minus the force of the spring on the wall. And this is only true if you can neglect the mass of the spring. Now, why is that important? We don't usually worry about the force of the spring on the wall, but here, I'm gonna make the situation a little bit more complicated. Instead of having a wall here, I'm gonna put a big, big, big mass here. Now, like a wall, a big mass doesn't move very much. But now it, you can see that it could start to be important to know that the force of the spring on the mass is the opposite, the force of the spring, on this very large mass that we've now put on the left. Now you know that if a really big thing pushes on a really small thing, it's the really small thing that goes flying. The really big thing doesn't move much at all. Even if a really big person pushes on a little person, it's the little person that gets shoved away and the big person only jerks back a little as they shove the smaller thing. So uh, a way of capturing that is that the change in the position of the big mass, capital M here, is much smaller than the change in the position of the small mass there. So you know in this situation, now that we have that, we could actually now consider the work done on the big mass and the work done on the small mass. So we know the force of the spring on the small mass is equal and opposite to the force of the spring on the large mass. And we know that the large mass goes much smaller distance than the small mass. Then we, because the work done on the big mass is the force on the big mass dotted into the motion of the big mass. And the force, the work on the small mass is the force on the small mass dotted into the motion of the small mass. We've now just learned that if delta Rm for the large mass is much smaller than delta Rm for the small mass, then the work done on the large mass is much less than the work done on the small mass. So now, where did this work come from? There's some work done on this small mass. If the spring was compressed, 
And now this maybe the spring expands and then a, a little bit later, this thing is moving slightly backwards. So this thing is moving slightly in this direction with some velocity. Um, maybe the spring has reached its natural length and these objects have now left the spring and this one is actually moving with some significant speed in that direction. So the compressed spring has created some kinetic energy, which is actually mostly in the small mass. This thing hardly moves at all. The work done on this thing is very small. The work was mostly done on this thing if this mass is much larger than that mass. So where did this kinetic energy come from? Well, we're going to introduce a new concept. We're going to introduce a new concept in this chapter, and it's called potential energy. And we're going to say that instead of thinking of this mass in isolation, that is, as something that has a force, which happens to be provided by a spring acting on it, we're going to think of the mass over here, the spring, and the mass over there as a complete system. And this part of the system will have gained a little bit of kinetic energy, pretty negligible. This part of the system has well gotten most of the kinetic energy, and this part of the system will have lost something that we're going to call potential energy. Now that's my overview of Night 10-1. Go read it in much more detail in Night 10-1, please. And then we'll go on to Night 10.2.